Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Grant's Interest Rate Observer of the Air. I am Jim Grant, and with me is, uh, is the extremely well-rested Eric Whitehead, our engineer just back from vacation. Eric uh, is wont to vacation in uh, exotic places, principally totalitarian countries, but uh, this time he, he, uh, he threw us all a curveball and went to South Carolina, I guess, to get away from the heat. Okay, and then uh, Phil Grant directly across from Eric. He's the editor of Almost Daily Grants and um, the great Evan Lorenz, deputy editor of Grants and... Uh, I don't know, and, and you, listeners, thank you. Uh, we are brought to you today is the Grant's Interest Rate Observer podcast by a Purple Mattress and also uh, by Grant's Interest Rate Observer. So I want to begin, ladies and gentlemen, I want to begin with a little um, a rumination on value investing. This comes from the prodigious talents of Maximum Muncie, the super utility guy, the Los Angeles Dodgers, who uh, did himself rather proud in uh, last night's uh, home run derby. Uh, my son, Phil, was watching, on the other hand, I was the, very busy. the situational hitting, the bunting competition, and the hitting, the cutoff man competition. That was narrow cast on channel 15,607, but uh, Phil is a is a serious student and not one of these uh, like uh, Homer guys, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so Max Muncy quoted as follows with respect to value investing. He calls it plate discipline. It's just kind of something I've always had. I don't like chasing balls that are outside the strike zone. I like to be very patient when it comes to which pitches I swing at. I don't know how it started or where it came from. It's just something I've always had my entire life. That sounds a little like, uh, you know, Seth Klarman or Paul Isaac, one of those right. guys. Yeah. So Maximum Muncy, um, I think there's hope for value investing yet. So that's that. And Evan Lorenz is, uh, among other things, is the staff sinologist. He has uh, news from China. Now, China is one of these places about which, Evan, you'll agree with, nobody knows nothing. Not, not even the Chinese. Less, right? Yeah. But still, there are stories, right? And, and China is consequential. So what do you, Evan, tell us? What? So China's financial system is big, and it's big because it's financed a giant lending uh, binge that fueled an investment binge since the uh, the financial crisis. But we're, we're beginning to see cracks this year in it. And the latest one came from Bloomberg today, which is that there's kind of a run on the bank for peer-to-peer -peer lenders, basically the, uh, the lending clubs of the mainland. This industry is relatively large. It has 195 billion under uh, management. And there's been a number of um, platforms that actually do these, you know, peer-to-peer -peer loans that have failed or turned out to be Ponzi schemes. So investors are kind of rushing to the door demanding to get their money back, which is leading to problems for the borrowers as well. A lot of smaller companies actually use these peer-to-peer -peer loans to fund like working capital. Some individual borrowers use it to actually invest in the stock market. It's kind of, you know, leading to everybody calling in their, their claims at now, the same are, time. Are these assets that are behind these loans, are they, uh, are they like okay or are they not so okay? So I, I go and make a deposit at one of these peer-to-peer -peer operations, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And they lend it to, they buy wealth management products? They... Uh, I mean, I think they can do pretty much, I mean, first of all, there's not a lot of great data on it. Second of all, they can invest in a wide variety of loans. And it could be like, you know, to an individual who wants to lever up, you know, a, a bet on a stock. It could be an individual who's, you know, paying for working capital as company. But the fact that these are mostly short-term loans and you have, you know, the, all the depositors come in here trying to yank their money means it's kind of a little bit of a mini run of the bank. And these are demand deposits, I gather. Um, I, I believe, I, I'm not entirely certain. I think they actually are, are uh, linked to the loans, but the loans are all short-term products. So it's not like it's a long-term, but this kind of adds to other problems that we've seen in China. As we've mentioned in previous podcasts, there's a lot of margin loans in China's stock market, and it's not individuals betting on stocks, but more company founders and companies actually using this as a means to access the financial system. It's actually $770 billion worth of margin loans, and it's equal to about 12% of China's uh, stock market. The Shanghai composite keeps kind of falling and it hasn't been able to recover. To forestall a liquidation of all these loans, the PBOC actually came out recently and said, hey, broker dealers, if you want to call any of these margin loans into your customers, you got to come to our office first and we'll talk to you. Hmm. So one would expect that uh, the credit spreads, if they existed in the Chinese system, would be widening, no? One would expect, yeah. And we, we actually have seen kind of um, high yield bond yields in China go above 10%. So Phil, we have seen some widening in this country? Yes, well, uh, a little, I mean, probably not as dramatic. Corporate spreads have, have ticked lower in, in recent weeks. But so they've tightened. Yes, little. correct. Um, but at the same time, leveraged loans, um, the, the much hotter mark category, the debt markets, uh, spreads have widened uh, considerably. And um, so say since December, the B plus or higher rated, so the, the better credit end of the spectrum in leveraged loans has risen by about 110 basis points, according to um, uh, S&P's uh, uh, LCD unit. But what's interesting to me is that uh, the bulk of that rise has taken place in the last two months. And, and during that period, uh, LIBOR, which is the interbank rate, which these are based off of, has not been moving higher. It's, it's remained flat. So this is LCD uh, surmises that it's um, it's because of oversupply, but um, it's it's not related to overall interest rates. Well, as, as constant readers of grants know, we had our say on uh, 
leveraged loans in the uh, current issue. And uh, I don't know, pretty good say, I thought. Agreed. That, everyone agreed? I liked it. Eric? Yep. Four for okay. four. <laughs> so I would like to have a just a brief chat with the deputy editor of Grants concerning Netflix. I am puzzled by a quotation that moved on the uh, LCD news. This is the uh, LCD arm, the very good analytical arm. I think of S and P. Is it no? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so Netflix comes out yesterday. Uh, we are speaking to you on Tuesday, the seventeenth. But it came out yesterday in connection with what the street took to be a, a somewhat disappointing earnings announcement. And uh, the company comes out and says. Um, that uh, it is uh, weighing uh, a new uh, a return to the high yield bond market for a new round of capital raising. As you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Netflix, uh, for all its uh, considerable success in content and in building a business, I mean, it's been merely fabulous in its growth and evidently in the quality of its uh, content because the Emmys, uh, so be speak. Uh, but it has not yet generated uh, the thing called positive uh, free cash flow. On the contrary, it has been uh, necessitously funding a deficit in free cash flow and has been doing this in part through the capital markets, right? Yeah. All right. So here's the money quote, which I think speaks to the capital markets in a more than micro way. Here is the company statement, quote, while interest rates have risen and the federal tax rate is now lower, uh, reducing the tax shield on interest costs, we judge that our after-tax cost of debt continues to be lower than our cost of equity. So we anticipate that we'll continue to finance our capital needs in the high-yield market, close quote. Now, Netflix comment, I think, is quoted or was quoted perhaps yesterday before the... Anyway, it was 130 times the estimate, 130 times, I think. Now, that implies a cost of capital, that uh, equity capital, that is vanishingly small. Now, I'm, ask, I'm, I'm addressing this question to the only CFA setting the table. Eric is not one. I'm not one. Phil's not one. Evan Lorenz is a chartered financial analyst, a charter holder. Well, I, I kind of feel as a CFA, I have to say something about beta and covariance, but it, it's cheap. Yeah, uh, that seems like a kind of a weasel. Okay, but uh, Evan, I think, agrees with me. It's uh, cheap equity capital, but still they contend that their, their debt costs are lower. So the, um, I don't know, what do they have outstanding? They have uh, five and seven eighths notes of 2025 and five and seven eighths notes, bullet notes of November 2028. They're trading around par. So that's kind of a almost six-ish cost of capital. Evan, is it possible that a stock trading at 100 times plus the estimate is implying an equity cost of capital of six-ish percent? Not unless earnings are going to go very, very rapidly. So you could say that maybe it's cheap on 2020, but that nobody's predicting that kind of growth. So they're bullish on themselves. <clears throat> well, that's... Uh, well, that's one way to put it. Yeah. Speaking of bullish, uh, have you guys uh, uh, been sleeping well? Eric, yes, yes or no? No. No. Yeah. Oh, for three. Uh, How about although you, Jim? Eric ought to have been sleeping well on vacation. Even then? No. On vacation. On vacation, yes. Okay. But if you have not been sleeping well... Uh, maybe. Um, it's not your anxiety. It's not uh, middle age. Uh, <laughs> save us. Uh, or restore us to middle age, as the case may be. If you're struggling to get a night, good night, if you're struggling to get a good night's sleep, uh, maybe it's your mattress. Try a purple mattress. So the purple mattress will probably feel different than anything you've ever experienced because it uh, uses this brand new material that is developed by an actual rocket scientist. What, like Elon Musk, that guy? Yeah, something like that. Or Submariner. Anyway, it was. This is not like memory foam. No, by no means. Uh, the purple material feels unique because it's both firm and soft at the same time. That's like some people you know, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. uh, so it keeps everything supported while still feeling really comfortable. Plus, it's breathable, so it sleeps cool. That yeah, looks cool, too. Here's what you get. A 100-night risk-free trial. If you're not fully satisfied, you can return your mattress for a full refund. And it's backed by a 10-year warranty, free shipping and returns. You're going to love purple. And right now, our listeners will get 10% off your entire order in addition to this week's free gift with a purchase of a mattress. So just go to purple.com and use this uh, promo code GRANT, G-R-A-N-T, at checkout. That's purple.com slash GRANT. The only way to get 10% off plus your free gift is to use my code GRANT at checkout. That's purple.com slash GRANT at checkout. I always think of uh, George H.W. Bush marveling at the technology of the checkout counter. I think it was a cash register that astonished him. But yes, Evan, you were... Do you know, do you know who else is not sleeping well after uh, Netflix's report? Active managers. Today, the Bank of America Merrill Lynch uh, Global Investor Survey came out, and they found that investors who are long fangs and bats, which are the fangs of China, are... Wait, are fangs and what? Bats. Baidu, uh, Tencent, and um, Alibaba um, 
uh, are, net 53% of survey respondents are, are net long these, and it's the most overcrowded trade identified for investors for the sixth straight month and the most crowded trade outright since the long USD in January 2017. So, so uh, Netflix was down 13% after it uh, reported the, the bad subscriber growth. Yeah. Can't help but notice that the long USD January 2017 was not the time to be long the dollar. Um, the other two crowded trades cited in this report are short emerging market equities and long oil had done terrifically until about last week and has undergone a very sharp pullback. I also note, and let us close on this hopeful note, that... Um, uh, a record net 17% to the Bank of America respondents think gold is undervalued. Undervalued. Well, it's more undervalued today after. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I think what they mean is that uh, gold is uh, is looking to uh, beat expectations the next quarter. Yes, that's, yeah. Well, anyway, gold is undervalued with respect to the alternative, that being the, uh, the reign and rule of the central bankers. And we'll see about uh, that as the uh, cycle unfolds. Uh, is it today, Evan, that uh, Jerome H. Powell is appearing before uh, Congress? Is that... Uh... I believe it's today. I actually yeah, saw some is. of the prepared remarks that he uh, yeah. gave in Bloomberg, and it's in the last page of the packet. I yeah. Think. Well, um, and the final, final closing note, I want to uh, uh, spill a few of the beans of the current issue of grants and to observe that uh, the Humphrey Hawkins Act of 1978, this is the 40th anniversary of the enactment of this landmark press spectacle legislation in which the Fed chairman goes and says a lot of stuff before the congressman. The 40th anniversary of this is the time to remember that the Humphrey Hawkins legislation stipulated that uh, the Fed should engineer an inflation rate by the 10th anniversary of passage, 1988 or so, of 0%. Not 2%, but 0 Now, that was, to be sure, there were stipulations attached to that, too, that you, uh, as long as 0% inflation rate did not interfere with uh, full employment. But uh, everyone says the Fed is, you know, it's a, a dual mandate. It's got to get 2% inflation. Well, there's no dual mandate that says 2% inflation for, the, for one thing. And the second thing is that under the law, 0% is the law, or at least a law of the land. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, chew on that one. You know, speaking of CFA, but not to be sure now of Humphrey Hawkins, Evan, I, I want to hear how you react to some uh, observations that uh, your colleague Phil has about the CFA program. It's a new thing, new part of the curriculum. New is the word. And um, this would seem to be of moment to those who uh, hold the charter. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, let me, uh, just by way of introduction, I'll just read from Bloomberg. Uh, the CFA material on crypto and blockchain will appear alongside other fintech subjects, including artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, and automated trading. More crypto topics, such as the intersection of virtual currencies and economics, may eventually be added to the curriculum. That's the CFA curriculum. Yeah. So what do you think, CFA? Well, the CFA has a lot of other stuff, like the uh, the efficient market hypothesis that they really drill into your brain. That's the idea that all information is instantly discounted to the market. And following the Bitcoin market, that means um, information changes value by 20% a day sometimes. Sometimes more, sometimes less. Well, we do live in the information age, Evan. Yeah. And I'm glad to hear you standing up for the Chartered Financial Analyst Program, which is one heck of a program. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us. This is uh, J. 